Welcome colleagues and friends to the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series, where we hope to think more humanely and practice more ethically as we face the other. I'm Muki Manalili, co-director of our Psychological Humanities and Ethics Initiative, and I'll be your host tonight with our special guest, Dr. Osman Ospino. Thanks for joining us today, Professor. Good to see you, Muki, and it's so great to be with uh, all uh, the audience, the students, the professionals who are interested in these uh, particular topics, you know, and I think that we, we are up for a good conversation tonight. I'm very excited as well. Yes, Dr. Ahasman Ospino is a native of Colombia where he pursued undergraduate studies in philosophy. He holds an MA in theology with a concentration in church history and a PhD in theology and education from Boston College. His research explores the dialogue between faith and culture and the impact of this interchange upon Catholic theological education, catechesis, and ministry. He has served as the principal investigator for several nationally recognized studies on how the Hispanic Catholic presence is transforming parishes, schools, and organizations. He has authored and edited more than a dozen books. And tonight in this Psychological Humanities and Ethics Dialogue, Professor Hoffsman and I will focus on key religious dimensions associated with migrant experiences through the lens of practical theology and psychological experiences associated therein. We'll explore four questions together and then we'll open up the space for questions from the audience. What do you say, Professor, are you ready? As ready as you are. <laughs> awesome, very excited. So let's dive into the first uh, question, Professor. Um, in what ways is religion an appropriate framework to analyze the immigrant experience? Sure. Uh, when we uh, normally uh, talk about the religious experience, you know, most of the conversation tends to focus on uh, the legal aspects of migration or the political ones, the socioeconomic dimensions of you know, why immigrants uh, uh, move in cross borders or uh, what's the impact of immigrants when they arrive into a particular society or a nation or a small town, small city, you no, know, or a large city anyway. But I think that uh, what sometimes gets lost in the entire process of reflection about this is uh, the religious dimension of uh, migration. You know? And perhaps you know, that religious migration invites us into uh, kind of take a step forward or backward, as a matter of fact, you know? and then and, and ask ourselves, why do people make that major decision about leaving their land, leaving their relatives, leaving their friends, leaving their uh, culture, their language, you know, and explore venture into a new reality? That search uh, connects in many ways for, with a search for meaning on what it means to be human. Every human person every human being is constantly searching for that which fulfills us, that for which we discern, you know, that we are made. And uh, when we do not find those circumstances that lead to, to meaning, those circumstances that lead to uh, happiness at the end of the day, you know, mm -hmm then we move, move, move forward. We search for a space where we can do this. And these two words, meaning and happiness are profoundly religious world, words, profoundly religious terms. So on the one hand, you know, we look at migration as a religious phenomenon, as a phenomenon that uh, you no, know, is part of the larger process of the human person, you no, know, searching for meaning and fulfillment ultimately happening. But on the other hand, we can, as believers, you know, we can take a look at uh, migration from a perspective, from a theological perspective, and do a theological perspective uh, or a theological reading of the 
reasons why migration are realities. And that theological reading, you know, leads us to observe that, you know, many people, perhaps most people, migrate because there are structures of injustice in the societies and in the contexts where they live. Sometimes those in, uh, structures of injustice are poverty, hunger, violence, you know, lack of affirmation, lack of opportunity. From a Christian theological perspective, we call those sin, you know? So immediately we begin to see that theological language allows us to look at reality and, and the experience of migration, you know, with, real, with, with, with categories that do not necessarily are reducible by legal, no, to legal or political or economic dynamics, no? I mean, who can, how can we measure, for instance, fulfillment? How can we measure happiness? How can we measure sin? Yet we experience these realities. And I think that uh, we need to be uh, important. We need to be important. I mean, we need to be attentive to how that religious uh, grammar, you know, permeates all the, that we do. And finally, perhaps, you know, uh, just to get the conversation going, mm -hmm. uh, we should not underestimate the religious uh, uh, practices or the religious uh, underpinnings, the religious traditions that are behind the decision people make to migrate, when they decide to migrate. We should not, for instance, uh, ignore how people discern and who they consult in order to move onto a migration experience as a pilgrimage. And usually those people tend to be clergy people, spiritual mm -hmm. leaders, people who have you know, either looked at the Christian tradition or the religious tradition and provided some advice. So all in all, you know, and uh, this is a question you haven't asked me yet, you know, is uh, how do I enter into this conversation? And uh, mm -hmm. I enter into this conversation as a theologian and particularly as a practical theologian, as a theologian who looks at reality, who looks at, uh, at reality as it, as it is expressed and then reads reality through the lens of faith yet in, the, in, in conversation or interdisciplinary conversation with different fields like sociology or politics, political science, mm -hmm. law, or uh, could be psychology and, and, and others, no? So that's the reading. I think that there is a potential for us to better understand the migration experience when we read it with these uh, religious categories. Yeah, thanks, Professor. And yeah, this takes me back to our, our course on practical theology in which you asked us through what hermeneutic lens, right, through what framework we are analyzing these experiences through. And yes, to, to share in dialogue with you through the lens of uh, both a clinical social worker and a researcher in the field of psychology, right? Uh, I think some of the, the words that you use are very salient, uh, even in our field, words like meeting, motivation, value, spirituality, right? These are the things that ultimately motivate human behavior and will choose, invite us to endure, right? Things like suffering, uh, things like being in a very different space than we grew up, right? For the sake of what, right? And I think, especially in terms of religious symbolism, which I know you'll elaborate on further, there are aspects of it, right? Like the journey, the pilgrimage, as you were alluding to, welcome in mystery, right? Those themes that are definitely charged with the weight and depth of various traditions, various cultures, very, various religions. Mm -hmm. And even with the word religion, right, for, for our, our people in the, the crowd with religare uh, being uh, the root of that which connects. So in essence, the, the question of, yeah, in what ways is religion an appropriate framework to analyze immigration experience, right? What are kind of the, the connections to the depth of different traditions in which we are analyzing why a person moves from one place to another? Um, again, from a, 
from a more psychological and, and clinical standpoint, only as of the past two decades have people began to uh, discuss things like uh, spirituality as part of the biopsychosocial and now spiritual model, right? Where we're at least more open to seeing that the biopsychosocial is not just a unit, but a unit that has history, a, a unit that has, uh, I was going to say, ambiente y eterno, but you know, <laughs> a person that is within an, an environment. Uh, and that environment, not just as a physical environment, but an environment in which meaning is constituted from tradition, from religion, right? So that dimension of the human person as a source of why we do what we do, right? Um, why do we move from one place to another in the framework of religiosity, right? And um, perhaps what are both the motivating factors, but also even some of the practices associated with it. And, you know, perhaps that brings us to a uh, moment number two. Um, what rituals and religious practices are common among immigrants as they embark on a journey crossing borders? Sure. Uh, be before, before I mention the, you know, some of these uh, rituals and, and practices, Muki, uh, I want to mm -hmm. uh, highlight two things that you, <laughs> that you indicated from this from the psychological perspective, uh, one is the sense of interconnectedness, you know, that uh, definitely shapes the self, you know, we are with others and we are because of others, you no? Know? And that is at the core of uh, most religious traditions at the same time, you know, so, that sense of interconnectedness that places us in relationship with uh, relatives, with neighbors, with uh, fellow citizens, with people we don't know, people we have never met and will never meet, yet we are part of a larger whole, you know? And what happens with migration in many ways is that that sense of interconnectedness is broken, you know? That sense of interconnectedness is uh, taken apart and the person who is part of a larger network, you know, a larger community or a larger, you know, a, a larger whole that gives and provides a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. somehow is totally, to totally affected. Mm -hmm. and also, there is a displacement in many mm -hmm. ways, you know, mm -hmm. a, a displacement of the self, a displacement of the, of the being. And again, those are just as they are psychological, they are also profoundly you know, theological questions because when we speak about women and men of faith, you know, uh, one is no one is church on their own. We all are church as we belong with and belong to a community mm -hmm. of others who share the same uh, convictions, who share the same journey, who shapes us, you know, who shape us on a regular basis, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the values that we espouse, you know, and correct us, you know, what, you know, as we make mistakes, and then we certainly, you know, search for a healing, for forgiveness, and so on. And again, the, the immigration experience in many ways disrupts the church, disrupts that sense of belonging, that sense of, of, of being church. Mm. And I think that that is fascinating because in, in, in many ways, you know, uh, when we encounter the immigrant, we're not encountering just an individual you know, mm. who crossed the border and who, I mean, in political rhetoric today is coming to take away our uh, resources or is trying That's to, right. is coming to That's threaten right. us. What we find often is uh, someone who has who's broken, someone who mm. unfortunately whose, whose sense of self is profoundly affected by the decision of having to move, you know, and, and cross uh, uh, boundaries. The other thing that you also mentioned, and this, and this one, my remark is more briefly, is the connection to spirituality. You know, mm. I think that uh, th there is a, there is a a key. For us, as you know, whether psychologists, counselors, ministers, or educators, people who are accompanying mm -hmm. immigrants, to recognize that uh, 
a, a, a holistic reading, a holistic mm -hmm. reading of the immigrant experience must not, cannot ignore the spiritual dimensions that, that, that take place. Now, whether people describe their spirituality in Christian uh, categories or mm -hmm. Muslim categories or Jewish, or uh, just name it, you know, any of the major religious traditions or any other religious tradition, now, that sense of spirituality, mm -hmm. you know, pro provides a cohesiveness, you know, that allows us, that, that allows us to understand better, you know, once again, the sense of wholeness. But let me get to the rituals That's and beautiful. practices. Mm -hmm. Let me get to the rituals and practices that are, you know, common among immigrants. Uh, it's fascinating, you know, and I want to highlight, uh, I have it here with me, the work of, um, of, this, of sociologist Jacqueline Maria Hagen, you know, mm -hmm. she wrote a, a fascinating book called Migration Miracle, Faith, Hope, and Meaning. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful book, you know. Uh, she spent some time with immigrants, you know, coming from Central America, crossing, you know, different countries in Central America, crossing Mexico until arriving in the, uh, in the United States. And I'm gonna focus on this particular group, one, because I'm more familiar with the Latinx, uh, Hispanic uh, immigrant experience. And, uh, and two, because I mean, it, it will, it'll take us about five hours to try to address every, uh, every, every single group and every single practice. But this, this is a, a teaser into, into this idea. Uh, Jacqueline he Maria Hagen, you know, and, uh, and, and, and many others who've been studying this and anybody who works in ministry knows that the immigrant experience is accompanied by rituals at different moments. Rituals of discernment, rituals of send off, rituals along the journey, and then rituals actually at the time of arrival, you know. So there are rituals and practices that one discovers, and uh, or I, I, I'm fascinated about, for instance, the work of you know what happens in in the in the community, you no know, Central American communities, you no know, when someone decides to leave, you no know, to depart, you no. Know? So mm -hmm. people, the community gathers together. The community gathers together and pray rosaries for this person, mm -hmm. you no know? Roman Catholics. So they pray the rosary they go to masses. There are masses in parishes in Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, where you no know, immigrants go and priests have a special blessing for them. So there is this particular send off, you know, and they, they go blessed. They know themselves to be blessed, you know. Then we got practices along the way, and sociologists have identified a number of these practices. Uh, there is a, there are devotions, you no, know, and there are shrines. As a matter of fact, along the way, you know, that there, there is this passageway from Central America all the way into the U.S.-Mexico border, and there are shrines and spaces where migrants, you no, know, journey and stop to pray. They they stop to ask for uh, protection. They stop for uh, to give thanks for mm -hmm. you know because the journey you know is hard. It, 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 it is 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 difficult. So there are um, novenas that immigrants have developed along the way. You know, and once again, novenas. So the journey will will go will go well, and. Perhaps one of the most beautiful religious practices that I that, that I like about this is what you no know, what the immigrant experience awakens in people who witness the immigrant journeying around, you know, as, as they cross from one nation to the next, you know, as they cross Mexico. And then, you know, people see many of these immigrants struggling with hunger struggling with lack of hygiene, struggling mm. with uh, lack of jobs or lack of resources so they can eat or they can uh, have some medicine. And then it awakens that desire of being good Samaritans, you know? that it's just this, this religious desire to help the other. So the entire experience you know, with these particular rituals 
and what those and, and what the experience awakens in others, in a sense, you know, gives us a sense of a church that is on the move a church mm -hmm. that is pilgrim. And from a theological perspective, this is fascinating because it is a reminder that, and as a matter of fact, one of the most beautiful images that we have mm -hmm. for the church, that we are a pilgrim church, you know? And all these dynamics point to, um, point to the journey of migration as a pilgrimage, you know? Sometimes a treacherous pilgrimage, sometimes a successful pilgrimage, sometimes a not a successful pilgrimage, mindful that many people unfortunately die in the, in the journey or, or get hurt you know, al al along the journey. But again, if you continue to follow, we continue to follow these dynamics, you know, we encounter religion permeating everything, everything along the journey. Mm. Professor, that's, yeah, that's beautiful especially that idea of the church as pilgrim and how these lived experiences and these rituals are not only for those undergoing the journey, but us as a community to be reminded of who we are, right? As people on the way, as, as voyagers. Um, I mean, this also speaking from a place, uh, maybe less of the psychological, but more of the personal lived narrative coming from the Filipino community, right? In which, uh, a majority of our nation is now in diaspora, uh, and right. What does it mean for us to be called from from the place uh, we are birthed from, uh, and you know, beckoned over by the American dream and uh, all of those other things? But when I ask my uh, folks and maybe some of my other villagers and and country folks why, it's always that sense of I want to pass on a better future. Right, uh, there is a sense of a journey, not just for themselves, right, but for a better life to be handed off to the next, right. And as we investigate what it means for the church to be pilgrim, right, what does this journey mean, not only for the people undergoing the journey, but the church in which we hand things off down to the next. And again, uh, I apologize for 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 the crowd and for yourself, professor, but. Remember from the class, I, I really enjoy etymology, uh, but the idea of tradare and tradition, right? Even even that as a Latin word means to be handed, to trade things. So the tradition of it being a pilgrim church, what does it mean when we hand things off, not only doxologically or you know theoretically and by belief, but by practice, right? What it mean? What does it mean to be a practical theology? in which we have sacraments and rituals in which people experience these things. And I'll comment a little bit uh, actually on the neuroscience in terms of episodic memory, and then I'll hand it uh, back to you and I'd love to, to hear how you respond, right? Um, because these, these practices provide a sense of embodied experience for the things that we preach the idea of welcoming the stranger, right? The idea of going on a journey. Even things like the spiritual exercises uh, by St. Ignatius, which is a 28 day silent retreat, if you have the time and the luxury to do so, or the 19th annotations in which you're able to intersperse it through your life. There are a lot of practices in which you imagine a journey, mm -hmm. but a lot of people find that very, very moving still. Right, so there, there is actually something in the way that our mind, our brains kind of imagine. Uh, it runs it through the same hippocampal horn. Basically all that to mean that both lived experiences and imagined sequences of experiences are looped through both imagery, imagination, memory are looped through the same kind of processing, right? And of course, embodied by our very same being, right? So what does that mean to pull from a past, right? In which we draw from the depth of a tradition in which there is a narrative of journey. And then we loop that into an imagined future, right? It creates a sense of structuring as opposed to just kind of the unknown of going into a land unknown. Well, at least it is structuring it in a way that there is kind of a a pilgrimage and a, the journey. And neuroscientifically, it is fascinating that both imagination and memory is looped through the same system, right? So what does that mean when you not only loop it by yourself, but in community and practices in a history that is even more elder than you and 
bringing it to the first point towards a future that will be more elder than you as well. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me take a, a, you know, a different angle on, the, on this question of, uh, of memory. And uh, I mean, you, you reminded me, for instance, uh, for, we know that uh, particularly the Western societies, uh, especially in the last century, have become more sedentary, sedentary than ever. You know, I think uh, we, we lost we lost a sense of mobility in in, in, in many ways. No, so we, for instance, we we lost how do I, we don't remember what it means. <laughs> we don't we don't remember what it means to pilgr to walk or journey as pilgrims towards a church. For instance, you know, uh, we we rarely. I mean, uh, we live in a very privileged society like the United States of America, in which I mean, the United States of America. There was a time when there were more than twenty one thousand Catholic churches. No, mm -hmm. so literally, you had to walk out of your house and choose whether you were going to go two blocks to the right or two blocks to the left to go to church, you know, that, that, that's how long your pilgrimage was, you know, but I, I mean, in my, in my, in my, in my parish, my home parish, we have a trilingual community hmm. and we have, you know, English speaking, Spanish speaking, Vietnamese uh, speaking Catholics. And when I uh, communicate with, you know, and engage in conversation with uh, many of the Vietnamese Catholics, you know, immigrant, who are immigrants, hmm. uh, they share about uh, literally leaving their homes 24 hours before mass no 24 mm. hours that's a full day mm -hmm. and walking most of this time in order to get to a church have the experience of community and then mm -hmm. returning and you know what mm -hmm. when i speak to their children born in the united states of america these children did not experience that mm. however they remember through the testimony, through the witness, right. through the witness of their parents, no, and mm -hmm. but many of us don't re don't have those kind of strong memories about journeying alongside the you know, alongside the experience of uh, of sacrifice, you know, that goes mm -hmm. along, the, you know, uh, the, the Christian tradition in many ways, you know, you make the sacrifice, you make the effort, it becomes. An adventure; it becomes a quest, you know, to right. go and pilgrim toward to, uh, and be a pilgrim to, towards uh, the tradition. And I, and I think that you know the immigrant experience, in many ways, you know, connects us to uh, the imagery. You no, know, and again, this is part of that different angle: the imagery that immigrants often uh, assign to the place where they are mm -hmm. supposed to arrive or that they are seeking you know it's not a secret it's not a it's not a it's not something new to learn that uh pilgrims who came from europe referred to the united states of america as the promised land you no know? mm -hmm. they refer to the new promised land a land where they would experience freedom where they would experience the opportunity of uh, acquire private property where they would have jobs where they will have an identity well that's so, that's something similar you know, uh, that happens also to many latin american people who struggle with not only poverty but misery you know abject poverty mm -hmm. people who i mean people who have perhaps gone to a university made a sacrifice to better themselves mm -hmm. and then they don't encounter uh, an opportunity to live and live well in in their own societies people who have been the known persons as theologian gustavo gutierrez mm -hmm. you know, reminds us you no know, been treated as non person so they tend to look you no know, go to that uh, toward on that pilgrimage called migration and somehow idealize that promised land, you know, and that promised land could be Los Angeles, could be New York, could be <laughs> could, could be Houston, could be Miami, and we all know that there is little about paradise in those places, you know. I mean, because it's tough. It's tough to live in the big cities. It's tough to be an immigrant. It's tough to be mm. undocumented, uh, uh, undocumented as well. 
But what mm. there is something that nobody is gonna take away from these immigrants, and it's the memory, the memory That's right. of having gone through the journey and being shaped and reshaped by that journey, just as the people of Israel in the desert, you know, mm. walking in journey, migrating for 40 years in the Old Testament, we see, you know until they found their identity and solidified that identity. Mm -hmm. And it's that memory that kept them going, you know, uh, throughout all the ordeals that they experienced. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's such a powerful reflection on memory as well. And thank you for taking us there, Professor. Uh, I'll, I'll invite us into uh, our third moment then. Um, yeah, uh, we were talking about, right, many immigrants in the, the U.S. encounter an environment shaped by anti-immigrant rhetoric and suspicion, as we were kind of alluding to. Um, what does it say of our society and what potential effects can this have upon immigrants themselves? Well, the United States of America is a, is a fascinating society, you know. Uh, it's a, uh, I, it has always puzzled me that a society that is that has been constituted almost entirely by immigrants mm -hmm. continues to foster such a strong set of anti-immigrant sentiments and rhetoric. Mm. It is puzzling that a society that calls itself majority Christian, you know, uh, chooses to ignore the Christian values and the Christian call to welcoming the other, to welcoming the immigrant, to welcoming the refugee, and you know, and and then just afford to reject that person or to afford to denigrate that particular person. So there is an element, in, you know, uh, and I'm not a social psychologist, you no, know, in, in in this particular case, but there is an element of. <laughs> you know, uh, of uh, incoherence in our, in, in, our own so, in, in our own society about who we are and how we treat people who are like us, you see? There is an incoherence in terms of what we proclaim, what we, what we claim to believe and, we, and the values that we claim to uh, inform our lives and our actions. So, we need eventually as a society to reconcile this. And the problem, I think, uh, Muki, that we have mm -hmm. as a society, and that happens in the Catholic Church, it happens in our That's faith right. communities, and I speak as a Roman Catholic, one of the problems that we have is that unfortunately, we seem to lack an appropriate grammar to, to speak of migration. Mm. We have concepts, we have laws, we have books, and we have uh, narratives about migration. We got excellent historical narr narratives and, and, and experiences. Yet, all these, unfortunately, do not amount to a narrative that pulls us together as a society mm -hmm. to even consider the possibility of, you know, in thinking about, for instance, embracing, uh, uh, embracing in others. Many in, our, uh, many in our society, you know, and that includes believers, that includes people of goodwill, most of people of goodwill, you know? Mm -hmm. And so many in our society, and particularly in our political circles, regularly engage in revisionist history, okay? And that's one of the, the, the challenges that, uh, that, that we have, you no? Know? When we engage in this religion, you know, revisionist history, and tend to idealize you know, mm. the immigrant mm -hmm. of the past. You know, mm -hmm. I have always, uh, I mean, I, when, when I give presentations about these topics or engage in mm -hmm. conversations, uh, academic and pastoral conversations, you know, I always say, uh, I mean, when somebody comes to me and says, um, my grandfather, my great, great, great grandfather or grandmother came all the way from Italy without a penny in their pocket. And then they arrived in the United States and a week later they found a job and they learned English and they worked really hard and they were successful. And uh, the truth is that most immigrants who arrived from Europe 
came poor and died poor. <laughs> so that's the, mm -hmm. many of them never learned the language. Many of them never mm -hmm. succeeded in at least in the terms that we call success to, you know, these days measured in financial terms or educational terms or, or, in, or, or in terms of political social influence, no? Mm -hmm. So but what we know about these immigrants is that they were struggling they made they they, they made the, the the journey. They took the risk, and they arrived in a land, and somehow, with their lives, with their decisions, paved the way for the next generations to eventually do something with with with, with their lives, you know, and, and and with the society. So, by romanticizing, but by, ro by romanticizing the experience of past immigrants through an exercise of revisionist history, what we do is we dishonor that history. We dishonor the experience and the narrative of those immigrants, no? And we cheapen it. We minimize the impact and the sacrifices that these women and men uh, made back then, no? So, and, not, it's, and it's not only the revisionist uh, exercise of, uh, of revisionist history, but also we engage in uh, fear mongering, you know, uh, fear mongering about uh, uh, immigrants becoming threats, immigrants bringing illnesses, immigrants being thieves or immigrants and refugees being people who are here to steal and take away and, and, and away for, for us. And what's the whole point? Political gain, most likely. Mm -hmm. Or what's the whole point? Simply to continue to advance ideological uh, ideological positions. What are the implications of all these dynamics? On the one hand, we got the, the biggest implications for us as a society is that we tend to marginalize our immigrant communities. We tend to marginalize mm -hmm. immigrant communities. I mean, one of the let me just give you one particular sector: farm workers. No, mm -hmm. we know that in the United States of America, the vast majority of farm workers are Hispanic, and most are undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. The average pay per hour that an undocumented immigrant working in the farm working world feels uh, um, make is about seven or eight dollars seven mm. or eight dollars an hour. We are exploiting these people. So we as a society have, are creating these subclasses and we with all, with all our Christian values and with our self-righteousness self as a society, as the American people, the moral society in the world, somehow find it easy to exploit these immigrants just as we have mistreated black people in the United States for mm -hmm. centuries and racism continues to permeate much of, of, of who we are, you see? So mm -hmm. that in a sense, you know, the harm is internal. It's internal to us as a society because in a sense, you no, know, it calls, it calls out the hypo hypocrisy the, of, of what we claim to be, but you know, which is contradicted by what we do. And then the, in terms of the effects on the immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, immigrant population, uh, well, I mean, we, we could go through a laundry list of, uh, uh, of these, um, of these uh, implications. For instance, low self-esteem, you know, low self-esteem. I mean, when somebody feels under threat on a regular basis, when, 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 when you are told that you are lazy, mm -hmm. that you are a threat mm -hmm. and so on, that eventually you know, uh, makes, uh, indwells in, you know, in, in the person. It, stay, it stays in the person and it affects you know, who you are and how you present yourself to society. This is one mm -hmm. of the reasons why in many immigrant, many immigrant communities are afraid of law enforcement. Many mm -hmm. immigrant communities refuse to vote, you know, even though many of them are actually legal citizens and citizens in the United mm -hmm. States of America, but they refuse to vote because they don't believe in a system that has been denigrating them on, 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 a, regular, uh, on a regular basis, no? So there's an mm -hmm. internalization of negative categories 
we cannot ignore, and there are plenty of, of, of studies on this, that you know, when the news, when, when Latinos, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly immigrants, are mentioned in the news cycles by the major networks and the small networks, local networks, or mm -hmm. uh, 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 news networks, the majority of times Latinos are mentioned and immigrants are, are mentioned, they are mentioned in negative ways. Mm -hmm. they, they are mentioned when someone someone dies or when there is a theft or when there is uh, something, uh, when there, there is a crime, no? And we fail to see these, uh, uh, you know, affirmations in the Latino community or, or the Indian community. And that eventually affects us. I mean, look at what's happening with the pandemic these days mm -hmm. and how that is affecting the Asian community in the United mm -hmm. States. There are many people who feel entitled to be violent towards people of Asian mm -hmm. descent or immigrants from Asian just because there is this weird, strange, you no know, unfair, unjust, you know, rhetoric out there that the virus, you know, is the quote unquote Chinese virus, you know. I mean, look mm -hmm. at the harm that political language can do on, on, on people and, uh, and, and, and on immigrants. So, and perhaps the last thing that I would say in, in terms of, uh, of uh, effects upon the immigrant community and we need to be attentive as religious leaders, as uh, social leaders, like psychological leaders and so on, is the fact that uh, uh, by denigrating the immigrant, uh, the immigrant self, then we create a sense of reciprocal fear and suspicion that prevents us you know, from building or uniting uh, our efforts mm -hmm. in building the, the common good. Mm. Wow, Professor. I mean, there's <laughs> there's a lot to, to sit with there, right? And I, I think I'll, I'll take this a little bit in terms, actually, of some of the psychology of, I know that we presented this as a psychology of community, but I also like to present some of the psychology of this community, uh, per se. Uh, in one of our previous lectures, we had a fantastic uh, lecture by uh, Professor Miriam jernigan Nwesi, who talked about racial trauma. And in a previous lecture before that as well, we had one by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who talked about uh, the stress embodiment uh, through a little bit of neuroendocrinology and glucocorticoids and you know all, all of those kind of mechanisms. But the idea of what happens when we internalize kind of a society that looks at us with fear and suspicion to the point where it begins to seep into kind of our ver very understanding of the self, right? There are a lot of dangerous psychological implications therein. I even think of a uh, writer, Franz Fanon, who wrote the book, Black Skin, White Masks, and talked about how, right, there is an internalization in the Martinique people uh, of the subservience, even if they were not the minority, actually, they were the majority in their society, but there was an internalization that white skin meant, you know, quote unquote, of higher status uh, to the point where it actually becomes internalized in narratives such as that. And yeah, I'd love to uh, amplify this a little bit in terms of actually some of the research uh, done by Professor Leanne Young, who will be our presenter next week. Uh, in the morality lab for which I have gained a lot of knowledge from and just being in that lab. But part of uh, the work uh, there is looking at some of the data sets from uh, Project Implicit uh, over at Harvard. Uh, there's a researcher by the name of Mazarin Banaji and the rest of uh, kind of her cohort who looked at biases. So typically this is seen in terms of in-group and out-group in psychology. And there's a lot of different ways uh, to study this, but typically it traces its roots back to the idea that we as human beings will categorize, uh, right? Even Piaget's uh, cognitive model talks about how we have categorizations as we right, navigate the world. Um, but what happens when in something benign, like a deck of cards, right? If I ask, you professor or you the rest of the crowd to categorize the cards you might say okay hard spades clubs diamonds or red and black or numerical and face cards right so you can categorize the same quote unquote phenomena a couple different way but what happens when those categories become tinged with distrust for outgroup members 
you see a particular face and the closest association you have is narratives of fear, right? And then what happens uh, when you charge that bias and it becomes internalized, not only by you looking at an outgroup member, but those group members, because they live in a society in which that is the closest association. It's kind of like you're saying, uh, in which Asian Americans now must be a little bit more cautious because of the way that their fellow citizens look at them in the way that Latin, no Latina, Latin X uh, Americans have a particular way of understanding their being in the world as subservient, uh, whether in farm workers and, and things like that, right? And what happens when those categories become fixed uh, as they continue to be echoed upon. And right, this is kind of the in-group, out-group um, biases, but the problem is um, those can also be internalized uh, by in-group members themselves. The prejudices and the biases, like you say, uh, have effects. And as you noted, we do not have the language uh, towards uh, the community that we are hoping to move towards at times. And before we move to the fourth segment, maybe I'd love to hear some of your responses therein. Sure, no, and uh, no, as, as, as I listen, uh, as I listen to you, Muki, um, uh, and, and, and this question of, of the language, whether, whether we have it or whether we do not have it, you know, it's, uh, I mean, anybody who, could, who, who reads uh, Catholic social teaching, for instance, or who mm -hmm. would read uh, mm -hmm. some of the just basic, you know, understandings of migration law and so on, would say, yes, we, we, we do have a language, you know, we, we, we do have a language to speak about migration and the embrace of immigrants and the in integration of immigrants and so, and so on. And, but the, the question is that uh, there is something missing that is, you know, I mean, we, may, we, read, we, we, we read the same language. We, we read the same language as a, as a society, but we don't interpret it in the same way, you know? Mm -hmm. And there is something that, you know, mm -hmm. the, I, 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 I go, on a regular basis, down to the the chase here, and it's cut to cut into the chase, and it's ideal, you know, ideological polarization. You know that 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 at the end of the day, that's what continues to separate us in the, in, in the United States of America, and this idea of uh, you know the internalization of um, internalization of uh, rhetorics that uh, in a sense lead us to. You know, embrace subservient uh, behaviors and and so on. Uh, de definitely, Fanon, you know, and, and and many other of philosophers, thinkers, um, uh, intellectuals who've been, uh, you know, uh, cultural anthropologists and so on, who've been discussing uh, these matters, are absolutely right. You know, because uh, so someone benefits from this, mm. uh, which is that, uh, which is what, which is unfortunately the case. You no. Know? I mean, by treating people who are uh, black or Asian or Latinx or Native American uh, negatively, by treating uh, women or members of the LGBTQ community negatively, mm -hmm. by treating the immigrant you know, negatively and, mm -hmm. and kind of marginalizing these people, uh, yes, these, most of the time, these people become the losers you know, in an equation that gives them little opportunities and not steal their voices, steal their rights, steal their dignity. But we cannot ignore the fact that somebody benefits from this. And I want to just go back, for instance, to the example of uh, of the farm workers that I that, that I was uh, that I was mentioning. You know, I mean, we knowing that most of the, these people are uh, immigrants. Many of them, the majority, are uh, undocumented, as a matter of fact, and uh, farm workers particularly in the, in the Southwest of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And no, mo, many, much of our conversation tends to focus on, um, on the actual immigrant who is undocumented in the country and is a threat for, mm -hmm. you know, or to society or to a particular set of the population. But what very few people discuss is the fact that the companies that are hiring them, you know, mm -hmm. that, the, that many of the of, of the farm owners who are who are hiring them, 
you know, are saving themselves tons of money and not only, you know, because they don't pay them fairly, no, they don't pay, pay them justly, but not only that, they are profiting from their work, you know, and I mean, in a sense, it's, 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 it's modern slavery, you know, and, uh, which needs to be called out, you know, and, and, and it needs to, it needs to be named, you know, when, uh, I mean, I, I, I really fear, uh, not fear, but I feel um, for, uh, for instance, uh, these many immigrants, you know, when, when the, the U.S. government, when ICE decides to do a raid, you know, in mm -hmm. meat packing plants, for instance, or any other type mm -hmm. of plants, and then what's what they do? They just, you know, canvas all these immigrants, they take them away, they leave them to detention centers and so on, but the ones who most of the time live unscathed are the owners of the plants, you know, the mm -hmm. owners of these of these businesses. And that is, I mean, that that points to what I was talking about earlier, right. structural sin, you know. So we find these, I mean, and this is the religious reading that or the theological reading of these dynamics, that many of these people were escaping, they were escaping structural sin in their particular context. So only to and they yeah. arrive into a society right. that is you know, gives them a, a different set of you know, structural sin. And, and the mm -hmm. question is, who is going to advocate for them? Who is going to name that? Who's going to call prophetically mm -hmm. those realities and act upon that? And I mean, that takes us beautifully to our last uh, kind of question, Professor, is uh, how do immigrants challenge faith communities and larger society? Well, that's uh, I, I think that... Uh, Perhaps we can take here a, a Levinasian uh, approach to, to Fantastic. you know, and Emmanuel Levinas, and we need to begin by saying that the sheer presence of the immigrant, just by being present, just by being with us, mm -hmm. just by being our neighbor, our snow, not confronts us immediately. That's the, that's the first thing that we can say. I mean, we, we could use any label that we want to use, undocumented, wet back, uh, illegal, mm -hmm. those horrible words that take away the humanity and the dignity of, uh, of a human being. We, we can use all of them, but there's one thing that we cannot ignore, and it's that they are here. They are with us, and their presence, their face, as Levinas says, confronts us. No, and that's that's the first thing that you no know, communities need to start talking about. Okay, what do mm. we do? And notice, I'm not saying what do we do with them, <laughs> because this, that, that's kind of the, the approach right. that many that, that many many of us have in our society or mm -hmm. uh, or uh, or, our, or our churches. No, what do we do with these people? No, and no, it's not about what do we do with these people. It's simply what do we do? Period. How do we embrace how do we respond how do we acknowledge how do we allow ourselves to be embraced at the same time no so this is not the utilitarian approach to mm -hmm. uh, relationships in which you know i welcome you while you are useful to me and i will deport you i will get rid of you when i don't mm -hmm. like you any longer no no, that this is the, the, so that's that that can cannot be the approach. It's is dysfunctional, completely dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we start looking at this question of uh, the immigrant presence amongst us, you know, the mm -hmm. immigrant presence, we need to or the, the the presence of the immigrant is an invitation for us to revisit mm -hmm. and have serious conversations about the ethical commitments that we have as a society and as societies in a globalized world, no? I mm -hmm. cannot sit uh, in the United States of America or in Canada or in Germany or in Spain or in Italy or any other so-called, you no know, quote unquote, developed nation. No, I cannot sit literally passively without you know, paying attention to what is happening in Latin America, 
Africa, mm -hmm. Asia, and other mm -hmm. countries that are usually sender nations, you no, know, when, when it comes to the migration, uh, the, the migration movement. I, I the, for instance, a war like, like what's going on in Syria has mm -hmm. to compel me, has to compel mm -hmm. me. I have to be concerned about that, you no. Know? Uh, look at the situation in, in El Salvador, uh, mm -hmm. Guatemala, and Honduras. You no, know, they call it the triangle, the triangle of death. You know, mm -hmm. so how, how do we how, how do we deal with the question of violence, gang activity, you no, know, the inability to live in peace in 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 these in in many of these territories, and I cannot be oblivious. To this, to this dynamic. So the presence of the immigrant, to me, I think, and this is the challenge to churches and societies, the presence of the immigrant is an invitation to get to expand our horizon, expand our imagination, and learn mm -hmm. more about what's going on in the world. Let's get our heads out of the television set, you know, and entertainment, our US society. And I'm sorry that now I think it turned into preaching. No, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, our U.S. society is extremely, extremely, extremely mm -hmm. distracted. You know, it's the society of entertainment, video games, soap operas, sitcoms, mm -hmm. movies, and just name it. You know, so in, in sports, and I love sports. You know, but uh, but we live completely, completely distracted that when we see immigrants dying as they cross the border, mm -hmm. that when we see people, you know, I mean, look at this whole situation about human trafficking that is part of this migration dynamic, you know, throughout the world. And then we just simply turn around or change the channel and life mm -hmm. moves on. So we got to reconsider, revisit you know, these ethical commitments. What are, what are our responsibilities in a globalized uh, society? Another way in which communities and societies are challenged, you know, I think is the, the conversation in that, that we need to have about the tension or the dynamic you know, between uh, rights and responsibilities. You know? So yes, for instance, right, in terms of rights, uh, we have, we know that every human being, and Pope Francis has been amazing. The United Nations has been great reminding us this, you know, every human being has the right to migrate, particularly when their mm -hmm. lives are under duress, under threat, you know, everybody has that, that, that need. And societies have a responsibility to mm -hmm. welcome, to embrace as much as possible you know, yes, in an organized way, because actually societies also have the right to uh, organize migration, you no, know, and to Im implement their immigration uh, or migration uh, policies, you no. Know? So how do we balance these two mm -hmm. out, you know, without having to imagine a zero sum equation here, you know? Does the does the right of the human person to migrate, you no, know, trample? the right of a nation to mm -hmm. implement or enforce its policies? The answer is not necessarily, not necessarily. And it's mm -hmm. the same with, uh, with responsibilities, no? We, got, we have the responsibility as a society of welcoming, supporting, assisting those who are most vulnerable, but at the same time, those who migrate have the responsibility to you know, mm -hmm. embrace affirm the values, the culture, the language of the communities that mm. welcome them. Because at the end of the day, if they want to belong, no, and I speak as an immigrant myself, no? Mm. So if they want to belong, if we want to belong, we also have to build community. We got to enter you know, and participate in the, in the questions of community. And the last thing I'm gonna say about this isn't precisely connected to this last point, you know? The mm -hmm. best efforts, that the Catholic Church in the United States of America and other faith communities can make vis-a-vis uh, -vis immigrants, you no, know, in terms of responding to their presence, is facilitating processes of integration. Mm -hmm. Of course, we need to advocate for uh, family reunification, 
we need to advocate for just migration laws. We need to advocate for just treatment of immigrants, particularly children and women, and you no, know, and 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 we need to uh, advocate for access to uh, the most basic uh, human benefits that we that a society can offer to the immigrant community. So all of that is important, but what we cannot ignore is that there is an even bigger responsibility and a big and ch bigger challenge, and that is creating the structures and conditions for immigrants to integrate in our faith communities, in our societies, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our in, into our political system. And that's where sometimes we fall short, you know, because I have met countless Catholics who are willing to go to, to vote for uh, uh, in favor of migration, just migration laws. They are ready to vote for pro immigrant or just in just migration um, uh, candidates, politicians and so on. They are ready to write to the to, to their senators or to the representatives or to their mayors, their governors, but they are not willing to create conditions of integration within their own community. And 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 that's only half of the way, you know, half half of the reality. Integration is key. How does it, how does that happen? It happens when we, for instance, develop, you know, help immigrants to learn the culture, to learn the language, to find jobs, when we ensure that these people are not going to fall into cycles of poverty, when we ensure that people are not going to fall ill because they don't have health insurance, when we make sure that their children go to school, receive adequate education, and they graduate and eventually become contributors to the larger society. That's a, a, a ministry, you know, speaking theologically, that is a responsibility that our society and our churches have, and I would like to see way more. And just allow me to give a shout out to the Center for Migration Studies mm -hmm. in New York, you know, uh, which was founded by the Scalabrinian uh, uh, fathers, because uh, the Center for Immigration Studies has been doing an incredible, incredible job within the Catholic Church, you know, raising awareness about the value and the power of, uh, of uh, integration or migrant uh, integration. And I, I would welcome everybody to explore their website and see the great resources that they have about this. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, I know that we're running out of time, so I'll just offer a brief remark and some thanks and then I'll, I'll give the floor for maybe one or two sentences for people to chew on as we leave but yes 100 percent, professor i i do hope that we continue to take on that levinasian lens that you were inviting us to right what does it mean for the gaze of the other to orient us even psychologists like victor frankl talked about and maslow uh the last level of the the hierarchy of humanity is not only um uh actualization, actually, it's transcendence, but it's a self-transcendence pointed towards responsibility, at least for Frankl. And as, as you were noting uh, from Levinas, what does it mean for the gaze of the other to direct our behavior and our action, right? And this might be one of the, the things that psychology grapples with, uh, and even philosophy, is the question of the self and the I. But how do we have an I that is not just riveted back to the gaze upon itself, whether out of enjoyment or leisure, like you were saying, but really at the suffering of the other. Um, how, how, does, how does the cry of our siblings actually orient our being in the world? And to loop that back to the very beginning, right? Maybe it's the, in that sense of joint pilgrimage together as a pilgrim church that we find community, not in the eye alone, but in the eye of greater tradition. So it looks like we're definitely out of time for our lecture tonight. Um, this event would not have been possible without the work of an entire village. I'd like to thank the Psychological Humanities and Ethics co-director, Associate Dean David Goodman, uh, who has also prompted me to read a lot of Levinas. Uh, additionally, I'd like to thank a team from those in the Professional and Continuing Education Department, including Caitlin, Marissa, Lillian Moen, Nana in the background, and our fearless director, Shana Hurd to our many collaborators across Boston College. 
Last but not the least, thank you to the crowd members today and in the future watching this uh, recorded video. Most importantly, thank you, Professor Hoffman Ospino, for inviting us to think a little deeper about welcoming a stranger. Professor, is there a final thought that you would like people to grapple with as they are called back into the pilgrimage of their life? Uh, I, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share in conversation, you know, and uh, for uh, raising, I know that some people uh, uh, asked a few questions, uh, provided a few questions, and maybe we should just uh, have a record of these questions and if we can identify them by email and we should be able to maybe provide uh, something in writing you know, at some point this week or in, in the following days. And my last thought uh, on this is uh, for, for those of you, whether you are in the legal field or uh, mm -hmm. educational field, psychological field, you are a minister and so on, uh, I think that my invitation is to be as mindful as possible of the religious dimensions that accompany the immigrant phenomenon and the immigrant experience. Make sure that they get into the conversations because uh, you know mm -hmm. there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of beauty, and there's a, there's much to ponder. You know, f using that religious grammar about um, uh, the immigrant reality. So thank you very much.